Hello, hello. Hi. How's everybody doing up there? Are you guys okay up there? Yeah? You did really well for that meditation. I'm impressed. Can you hear us? Yeah. Sounds good. How about in the back? Everybody all right? All right. Well, welcome to our first morning session this morning after our morning meditation session. Uh, my name is Owsley Brown, and I am co-chair with my dear friend and colleague, Gray Henry, of the 2013 Festival of Faith, which I think you all know now is called Sacred Silence, Pathway to Compassion. Thank you all so much for being here. And um, Gray, you want to say a few words? I'd just like to welcome you all, and thank you for being our family and participating in this extraordinary week that we're having here in Louisville. This is something very special for us all, and thank you for being with us. We'll make a few more thanks while we're at it, because as uh, you all can imagine, or let's put it this way, try to imagine putting one of these things on. It's interesting. <laughs> And uh, we've never quite done anything like this. And so, um, you know, the fact that you all are here is a very big deal to us. But um, we, we needed a lot of help to make this happen. And so we want to make sure that we um, offer thanks now to those that were such a key part of it. And starting with um, uh, the, the, the companies in town that were willing to help us financially, we want to thank Brown Foreman and Louisville Public Media and, of course, our great city of Louisville under the direction of our inspiring mayor. We'll come back to him in a second. The Thomas Merton Center, the Archdiocese of Louisville, the Muhammad Ali Center, uh, the Earth and Spirit Center. Uh, Father Joe is going to be with us today from Earth and Spirit Center. Fons Vitae, thank you, Gray. Uh, Idea Fest, Compassionate Louisville. I think many of you know about that. Much, much more to say on that, too. Val Jones and the Whiskey Row Lofts. And finally, um, Christy Brown for her ongoing and unwavering commitment to the Festival of Faiths. Um, this morning, we have a really uh, fabulous and exciting program. And um, let, me, let me kind of give a little bit of background uh, for those of you that are here for, for the first time. Um, this program uh, was the idea of our mayor, Greg Fisher. Now, for those of you who don't know uh, our mayor, who I am honored to say is among us today. Um, uh, he has been spending a whole lot of time in his short uh, uh, period in office thinking about what a, a really kind of bigger vision for a city could be. And he's uh, said uh, three key things, but I'll focus on, on one that is part particularly relevant to this festival, which is his absolute sure, absolute clear, totally sure idea that compassion is a key element to a successful city. And he has put it to us to imagine how to go about the business of making compassion real. And as he said yesterday, it's, uh, it's no small task. Uh, there's no end point. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's an intention of his. And, and, and one that, that he asked us at the Festival of Faith directly to take on when he learned uh, that the Dalai Lama would be coming to Louisville. Uh, he said, I love the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama is a big deal, and we need to make a big deal about welcoming him. So how about you all do a spring edition of the Festival of Face? Well, you know the rest of it. Here we are. Um, and so on the programming side, what we decided we needed to do was put together a program that really spoke as much as possible to compassion and the business of going about being compassionate. Um, and, and also tried uh, in some way to sort of uh, introduce to Louisville um, the, the, the sort of spirit and background of, of, uh, of, of the Dalai Lama and, and his world, because um, uh, he is uh, a man that you all might all well know uh, is uh, from Tibet, and uh, his spiritual orientation is Tibetan Buddhism. But what does that mean, and how does that connect to us here in Louisville, and how does that connect to our mayor's charge of uh, taking on this idea of compassion. So we've begun that program, as you know, and today's program will continue uh, the spirit of that inquiry. And I feel personally uh, extremely uh, grateful that this program is happening, in part because, lucky me, I uh, was uh, able to be um, in the, the room, the very big room of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, when the Sakyong and uh, Bishop Mark met each other. And now, a year later, here we are uh, in Louisville, which is just astounding. And so I, um, of course, want to want to thank both uh, Bishop Mark and the Sakyong for being here, but, but also want to give a little bit of introduction 
and, and start by saying that, um, as some of you may have seen, we have dedicated this year's festival to the meeting in 1968 between Louisville's adopted son, Thomas Merton, more on him later, and the Dalai Lama, who had a very important and very special meeting that both accounted for in their journals uh, and, and in their, in their uh, remarks since. Um, um, sadly for Merton, they were very short remarks because he died just a few weeks later. But um, the Dalai Lama has spoken for many, many, many years, ever since then, that his meeting with Thomas Merton was one of the three most important meetings of his life, says he, which is a pretty amazing thing, considering that he's met about every person you could probably ever want to meet. Um, in the case of, of Sakyong Mipa Mipushe, there's a, a very particular connection which makes me uh, feel especially grateful uh, to Rinpoche for his uh, willingness to come to Kentucky. His father, Chokim Trungpa Rinpoche, who many of you know, and who personally to me has been a huge inspiration through his books, uh, met Thomas Merton uh, on this very trip that Merton met the Dalai Lama. And in Merton's journals and in Trungpa Rinpoche's accounts, the meeting was very similar in many ways to the meeting that Thomas Merton had with the Dalai Lama, inasmuch as it was a deeply important meeting for both men. And I know that in the case of Trungpa Rinpoche, uh, he often cited uh, Thomas Merton uh, the way the Dalai Lama does as a point of, of inspiration and influence. And so I want to say uh, that it is um, especially gratifying, Rinpoche, that you would be here in Kentucky uh, to, in many ways, sort of continue the spirit of your father's connection to our adopted son. Mm -hmm. And I hope that that will be the beginning of a, of a, of a long connection between you and our state and our city. Um, it is also uh, uh, extremely gratifying uh, that Mark Andrus, Bishop Mark Andrus, uh, who is a dear friend of mine from San Francisco, would be here. Uh, he too has been, well, he has been to Kentucky before. And it took very little convincing, I'm happy to say, to, uh, to have him come back. Uh, he and, and, and the Sakyong just presented uh, a, a similar program, I think, to the one we'll see this morning just a few days ago in San Francisco at a conference that was um, uh, Sakyong's uh, intention to convene a group of people around the subject of an, what, what could be, what might, what might an enlightened society look like? Very interesting question. And maybe we'll hear a little bit about that this morning. Um, so I think there's a whole lot more I could say <coughs> And I, I think I will, will, will not say much more um, and maybe move into the subject of silence. Uh, as many of you know, we've attempted to begin and end our sessions with uh, a few minutes of silence. And so before I welcome uh, Bishop Mark first to the stage uh, and then the Sakyong, uh, maybe we could first check our cell phones. How many came with cell phones? I know I did. Should I check and see if it's turned off? Yes. I think it is. <laughs> Let's see, where's that cell phone? Everybody want to check their cell phones, right? OK. Pulling it out. Ringer is off. So if your ringers are off and you're feeling at ease, you, you may um, remember we've been given lots of good instruction already on how to consider just sitting quietly. But I'll ring this bell. Let's hope it doesn't fall off the table. And maybe we'll just stand together for, I'll keep, I'll be the timekeeper. Just for, yeah, we'll do two minutes of silence. Uh, and when I ring the bell again, Bishop Mark, will you come on stage? OK, and then, and then I think you're going to speak first, and then you're going to introduce the Sakyong? OK, great. Let's see how this goes. Everybody doing OK out there? Yeah. OK, here we go.
Yeah, we can walk up this one. You want to come on up, Mark? Yeah, you can, you want to, let's wait for Mark. Come on. Just take their places down. Yeah, and that's what we're moving away from. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. okay. Good morning. If you take your phones back out again, and look on them. Uh, do all of you have the ability to put them in flight mode? Because that would be what I'd like you to do. Because uh, that would be a way to say what we hope happens while we're here together. So if you just take your phones out and put them in flight mode, just indulge me. It's a kind of way to set an aspiration about what we're doing together. And it's maybe a playful way. Um, I'm going to just make a couple of remarks about why we are doing this together, the Sakyong and myself. Uh, this is not to have a discussion about the differences between uh, Christianity and Tibetan Buddhism. Um, that's an interesting discussion, but not one we're going to have today. And it's not to talk about something technical or abstract, uh, the mandalas that we're going to be talking about, but rather, it's to talk about the theme of this conference, which is sacred silence as a pathway to compassion. So I know about the Sakyong that he is deeply interested with the core of his being in basic goodness in all of you and in all of creation, and bringing forth that basic goodness for the healing of the earth. His title, Sakyong, means earth protector, and he embodies that and takes it uh, very seriously. Sometimes that seriousness is expressed playfully, but beneath it all is a great commitment to the times that we're in, which is a great challenge to all of us. Last Friday, as I was traveling to back home to California to join, to join Rinpoche, um, the earth passed a a big threshold, and some of you probably know what that was. We passed the threshold of 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the, air, in the atmosphere. What that means for you and for me and for our Earth is that uh, there is no going back on the devastating effects of climate change that will continue to increase over the next 150 years. Even if we put the brakes on today, as a world, those would continue and the parts per million are going to climb inevitably over 400. Uh, so for you and me, that means more frequent and more violent and more unpredictable storms, more droughts, and in our communities, it means more suffering. And so we are here. Uh, there are all kinds of levels of challenge about how to make a healthy community. Yesterday, I heard the mayor and another leader from your community talk about the challenge of joining East and West here in Louisville. And what does that really mean? And how that could be a mutual thing. So these challenges go all the way up from within you as an individual to our communities and to our planet. So we're going to try uh, to talk about that together. I'm going to ask you to listen to one brief quotation, and I'd like you um, to really attend to this. Uh, it, it's, a, um, it's a quotation from a psychiatrist who was writing uh, in the middle of the 20th century. His name was Carl Jung, and he did a lot of study on mandalas. A mandala means a circle that is deeply focused energetically on the center of the circle. That's all it means. And this is what he says. As a rule, a mandala occurs. That means shows up. People, people draw them, model them, create them, dream about them. Occurs in conditions of psychic dissociation or disorientation. For instance, in the case of children between the ages of 8 and 11 whose parents are about to be divorced, or in adults who, 
as the result of a neurosis and its treatment are confronted with the problem of opposites in human nature and are consequently disoriented. Or again, in schizophrenics whose view of the world has become confused owing to the invasion of incomprehensible contents from the unconscious. In such cases, it is easy to see how the severe pattern imposed by a circular image of this kind compensates the disorder and confusion of the psychic state, namely, through the construction of a central point to which everything is related, or by a concentric arrangement of the disordered multiplicity and of contradictory and irre irreconcilable elements. This, and here is, this is really important, this is evidently an attempt at self-healing on the part of nature, which does not spring from conscious reflection, but from an instinctive impulse. Please join me in welcoming the Sakyong to the stage. like to express uh, my great appreciation uh, to the city of uh, Louisville and to the mayor and to the uh, Owsley and the Brown family and particularly to my good friend here, Bishop Anders, who we met uh, a year, about a year ago, and uh, in California, and I was invited to his chapel, Grace Cathedral, uh, to present on this notion of uh, a good human society, and how that can extend from a notion of human goodness, or that human nature is fundamentally uh, good and complete, and I think that's the notion of mandala that we are in fact intact. And I want to just express personally, because obviously some of you know me and some of you don't, and I'm also delighted that there's uh, a lot of people under 50 up there. It's <laughs> 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 always good to see. <laughs> that um, many years ago, when my father, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, who was instrumental in bringing meditation, uh, Buddhism to the West, and who introduced many ideas that I think now are commonplace. Had a fortuitous meeting in 1968 in Calcutta, uh, where he met uh, Father Thomas Merton, and um, he landed, uh, Father Merton landed that day and uh, happened to essentially run into my father who himself was, um, had been living in England and then went back to India and uh, to make a pilgrimage himself. And then they had a dialogue which really inspired both of them. And that dialogue about East and West and about the qualities of uh, Christian uh, belief and uh, Buddhist belief and how they could both help the world. And one of the key things that uh, came out of that discussion was a genuine sense of uh, spirituality. And a genuine sense of spirituality essentially meant that how we can all be in silence, how we can all take time to trust ourselves or be with ourselves uh, in quiet, and that quiet is not a bad word that being in silence essentially means that we trust ourselves personally, 
and also um, as a human being and as a species. So a lot of meditation technique comes out of the ability to just uh, simply be. And from that being, it is not just voidness, mm. but it is the, really the sense that um, there is tremendous potency. And so sometimes in Buddhism, this uh, kind of notion of space is sometimes called emptiness, and sometimes it's misinterpreted as nihilism. But I think just like as scientists are discovering today the notion of sort of uh, dark matter, that the universe itself and the Big Bang Theory is really coming out of that space itself is poignant and it is creative and it is energetic. And that as we sit here, I always like to say when you're meditating, don't be fooled by the action of stillness. Because in that inactivity, a tremendous amount is happening. And so, it is sort of selling ourselves short if we think when we're doing nothing or saying nothing, nothing's happening. And I think at this time, and you know what, what originally Nick started in that discussion years ago, I felt like uh, we ran into each other, essentially. And we both had a connection with Mr. Merton. And we both inspired by that connection. And that has brought myself here today and to be with you and to talk about these principles. And Obviously, some of you are very, very well studied in uh, Buddhism and other faiths. And some of you, this is um, taking interest, which is great. But we decided to present the notion of uh, mandala um, as something that is, can become sort of esoteric and can become sort of spiritual fodder for much misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. But really, the notion of mandala, as we've talked about, is the notion of symbolism representing human sanity, and symbolism representing human completeness. So that is the notion of circle. And just to give you a general lay of the land, there is so the, the outer notion of mandala, which is what physical you paint. And these are what you have seen, especially um, if you've seen Tibetan ritual, the painted sand mandala. There's also physical structures uh, that are mandala, that are built, made out of buildings. Then there's the mandala of imagination, which is the meditative mandala, which is really what we're talking about in terms of what Jung, Jung was referring to in terms of some kind of centeredness in the mind. And uh, that usually focuses on a primary center, an image. And we have here, in the, in the one on the right, we have um, a mandala which is drawn, and in the middle it has what we call a vajra, which is a Sanskrit word that means indestructible, and it means diamond. So it is the at atamantine kind of quality mm. or the indestructibility of human nature. And uh, that you know we talk about that as wakefulness. And it is diamond-like because nothing can corrupt the human mind in a sense, in, in ultimately. And uh, this is the notion of that aggression and other emotions and so forth can not puncture, or in, I want to think about it as inherent healthiness or goodness. And my father liked to use the word basic goodness, inherent uh, wakefulness, these are the qualities. And so obviously we're translating into English in various terms, but that is what the symbolism uh, means. And then from that, compassion comes about. So compassion, I feel like, is very much the ability to trust ourselves allows us to feel our feelings and emotions. And I think it is hard to have compassion if you are unable to feel what others feel. And obviously, we're, this is a big issue. We're living in a time where sometimes we're cut off from each other. Mm. So it is hard to have empathy. And the notion of compassion, I also want to state, is coming from tremendous strength. And I think one of the things we're trying to do with this festival and all together is switch the vocabulary so that words like compassion, kindness, generosity are not seen as weak. That they're not seen as a weak response to a sort of aggressive onslaught. But that as humans, the softness and the ability for us to have uh, vulnerability and um, feeling is a sign of intelligence. When we feel we are awake, 
And when you're meditating, you're awake. You don't put yourself in a comatose state. You, you, you wake up and you feel your senses. And so that inner quiet allows for magnanimity. So Tibetan, in Tibetan, compassion is ying jie, translated as noble heart, compassion. But it is coming from the magnanimity of internal strength that allows us to incorporate others. So the mandala has a central focus, a central meditative aspect. And then it has what we call in Tibetan, chill, core, center, and fringe. And so the notion of center is our ability to hold our seat or hold our sanity. And that allows for a fringe or a retinue. So when you see a traditional mandala, you'll see a central deity, which represents the wakefulness. Then you'll see deities around. And those all represent the notion of <clears throat> the ability to relate to others in a non-dualistic way. And non-dualism, from the mandala point of view, is seeing the equilibrium of self and other. So when we see this equilibrium of self and other, then we treat others as though we treat ourselves. And through the process of meditating, we develop inherent respect for our innate qualities. Having respect for our inherent qualities allows you to respect others. So this, I feel, it is really sort of where we are in terms of social transformation. That if we don't find a language of self-respect and respecting others, then that is obviously when an individual is not respected, literally when we just don't say hello to somebody, we're, we're, we are not acknowledging their whole existence. Mm -hmm. But if you say hello, it's two human beings acknowledging their existence on planet Earth. And by that, you create a social network. And from that, you know, sort of society comes about. But as soon as, as, soon as you disempower another, then obviously there's a sense of uh, others not being able to touch their core and then from that, hurt feelings come about, animosity comes about, revenge, and various things. So I think these ancient principles, and I always try to say, you know, <clears throat> as Tibetans, we didn't make it very far on the technological scale, <laughs> but on this stuff, we're pretty good. <laughs> so, you know, I, you, can, you can consider this the technology of the mind, if you mm -hmm. wish which is what's happening now in ethics understanding this. But you know, these are very smart people. And I always like to joke, when my father left uh, India and came to the West, um, you know, he held this Buddhist tradition that dates, down, dates back 2,500 years. And uh, so he was venerated figure of society and deeply spiritual person. But then he, when he came West and started teaching meditation, they call it New Age. So all of a sudden, he went from being like, you know, the foundation of authority to, you know, some flighty person. And that's just because of how we are relating to it. And I think right now we're trying to unravel that, mm -hmm. that we both can respect each other and that these traditions do go back. And it is finding a common language of how to communicate about it. And, you know, as Mr. Benders and I have talked a lot about, I think we're, we are at a, a critical crossroads. And I think festivals like this is really important. And I'm here to support this. And this is my last... Uh, um, slide. By the way, I don't usually do this. So, <laughs> but the one on the left is called Shambhala, and this picture was actually taken in eastern Tibet in the uh, when I was there, and it is the notion of Shambhala as an awake society or enlightened society. It is a notion of good human society. It's a notion of citizens manifesting an inherent sense of goodness and using that as a foundational principle of society, as opposed to mistrust. And so this Shambhala is a legend. Mm. At the same time, it is considered to be an actual physical place that did exist centuries ago. Some say it existed in the fifth century BC. And so a lot of the notion of that society, and it's not, it's not necessarily a utopian fantasy, but it is really the notion of, I think, human beings overall searching for how we can get along and how we can live here in some kind of sane and good fashion. So that quest is ongoing, and I feel like right now the world is waking up, as, as we're hearing about last Friday, in terms of where we are in terms of the <clears throat> sort of carbon particles and so forth. We're, we're at a very critical point. And you know, I know I've talked to various you know, 
climatologists and so forth, and I think there's a lot of scientific things we need to do. But ultimately, I think many people feel like it does need to be some kind of uh, psychic, psychic wake up that we need to have. There needs to be some personal ability to relate to it uh, emotionally. So I think, uh, some, I think us doing a festival like this and looking at our faith and looking at our understanding is actually a, a valid and is actually a real solution to what is happening because the degradation is often on the basis that people do not feel good and people do not feel worthy and therefore we have to consume more emotionally and physically. And so if people on the planet are not feeling good about their inherent being in, in any kind of tradition, then naturally you know, the environment becomes just a place for us expre expressing our ravenous, insatiable uh, desire. And this is not so much that we need to have absence, but it is a notion that if we begin to appreciate ourselves, we begin to appreciate nature, begin to appreciate other cultures. And so we've come to a point where globalism has definitely brought us together. And you know, like Bishop Andrew was saying, this is not a dialogue between religions. Um, there's, many of them are very complicated, and there's many debates going on. But we're trying to connect on a human level, I think. And um, you know, hopefully this will help in that direction. Thank you. Um, that was beautiful and everything I hoped and knew it would be. Um, the mandala really broke into Western consciousness uh, as Buddhism and Hinduism moved into the, into the West. Um, the Sakyang's father wrote profoundly about mandalas. And then Carl Jung, whom I quoted, uh, also did tremendous uh, deep work on how these mandalas manifest in communities and in people uh, spontaneously, just coming up as they're facing uh, great challenges in their lives. Um, so the mandala in Christianity is relatively an unknown idea. We have icons. Uh, we have the, the famous cross that's on the other side of the stage, uh, which was venerated by St. Francis. Uh, those kinds of images uh, we are familiar with. When the Sakyang said that the uh, mandala also exists as an imaginative quality, I'd like to suggest that in the earliest, uh, earliest times of Christianity, there was a mandala community. Uh, so the work of uh, an interesting, two interesting scholars who don't know each other, uh, Alexander Shaia and Bruno Barnhart, Father Barnhart have suggested that the communities of the, uh, from the second through the fifth century of Christianity organized themselves around a, an imaginary, a community mandala. And it looked like this. Young people would be prepared for baptism. That is a rite of transformation. So that's how I'd like you to think about baptism as a rite of transformation. And it's very much like a Lakota person uh, in South Dakota in the late 19th century, Black Elk, uh, when he went on his vision quest. That was very similar, if you take it right down to the bones, like the preparation of young people for this rite of transformation in Christianity in its earliest centuries. And the elders would meet them as the newly initiated, and they considered this the most dangerous moment of the year for the elders. Because as they said, we are in danger of dying every time we meet the newly initiated. Why? Because the newly initiated will challenge everything about 
what we consider to be reality and settled truth. So our principles and our self-organizing ideas die when we meet these young people who have just gone through this rite of transformation. So the mandala was considered, the mandalas are dynamic. They are not static images. They revolve from a, around the center point. Now, the way that they revolve in this early Christian community is through gospel readings, reading, sacred readings that followed an interesting pattern, moving from the outside to the center. So typically, we read the gospels in Christian circles Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the way we find them in the New Testament. But in this rite of transformation for young people and for the whole of the community, they read them this way. Matthew, Mark, John, Luke. And John was at the center. So what I want to suggest to you is what is at the center makes a big difference what you conceive of being at this energetic center that pulls everything together and then sends it back out again in service makes a big difference. And the reason John was at the center was John itself is a mandala. The Gospel of John is a deep and uh, flowering document, story, that presents the, the deepest understandings in Christianity. So they placed the Gospel of John at the center of the mandala, and then you make your progress back out into the world with Luke, which is about how do we serve the world. Once we've made the journey in, and then we've ab abided in the center with John, then we don't stay there. We move out again in service. So I wanted to show you some of the ways that this shows up. This is an early Christian sarcophagus uh, where a, a body was placed. And what you see is the good Christ as the good shepherd in the center. And you see how everything is organized around that image. This was the dominant image of Christ for 800 years in Christianity. Almost no crucifixes, no Christ on the cross, but Christ the good shepherd. This is a very appealing image. And the energy of Christ the Good Shepherd is different than Christ on the cross. It talks about protection, love, intimacy. So if you place that at the center of the mandala, what energy do you have as you move outward? This is a, a really significant little painting from Syria where we think about the, the horrible uh, depredations and, and destruction that's going on now in humanity. This comes from the oldest house church in Christianity that has ever been discovered. Uh, it's uh, Dura Europus in Syria. It's very primitively painted, but full of energy and beauty. This is uh, a, a fragment of three paintings that was in a little part of this house church where they baptize people, this rite of transformation. Three images. One was Christ the Good Shepherd. One was Jesus healing a paralytic. And then this one, which is considered to be the center of the center of the mandala. The mandala of the Gospel of John, the center of that mandala is Christ walking on the water at night. And that's what you see in the right-hand bottom is the figure of Christ. And he's reaching out his hand to Peter, who's giving it a little try, walking on the water. Then he gets afraid, sinks down below the water, and is pulled up again. Why did they put that at the center of the center of the mandala? Christ walking on the water. This is the light that shines in the darkness, and nothing can put it out. So it's the middle of the night. The disciples are in a boat on the water, and Christ comes to them walking on the water, this little point of light in an overwhelming ocean of chaos and shadow and extends himself to them to empower them to do the same, to walk on water, to restore creation. 
the crucifix, Christ crucified, is at the center of some mandalas. The four symbols at each corner are the symbols of the four Gospels. And these are what move around. This is the energy moving around the center of the mandala. If the cross is at the center, it's different energy, than different meaning, than Christ the Good Shepherd or Christ walking on the water. Here, the, the center of the cross is where everything meets in your life. Good, bad, in Jesus or Paul's terms, Jews or Greeks, men or women, slave or free, and the differences between those polarities in your life and in the lives of the early Christians was not to dissolve them in the center of the cross, but to bring them into relationship with each other. That's a very important energy, to bring all things in relation to each other in the center. Everything has its identity, nothing loses its identity, but they become related to each other instead of cut off from each other. That's a very profound thing to put in the center of the mandala. This is a very early, maybe the oldest piece of stained glass in the world. It's in um, France, and it's the uh, head of Christ from Wissembourg. And I think I love it. I put it up there as an example of Jesus as the Christ that is embodying the divine, but being very human, like you. Embodying the divine, but being completely human. So it's a very appealing image at a human level. You feel the, uh, the attraction of the eyes, um, a vulnerable face, but strong at the same time. And if you put that in the center of the mandala, different things happen with that, that energy. And that is what Jesus says as he's walking on the water. They don't know who he is coming to them walking on the water. And he says, I am which is a declaration of divinity, I am he, Jesus of Nazareth. So a declaration of being just like you, that at the center. Now this, you see a center that is undifferentiated. So this is like the first mandala, in a way, that the Sakyang pre presented. Here, there is nothing in the center. And this, you could say, as Meister Eckhart would have said, is the God behind God. No images, no names. This is the principle of becoming. Everything comes out of that which we cannot see. This, you could say, is the parent God, if you wanted to put a name on it, or the ground of being. Everything comes up out of this. And this is from the Book of Kells from Ireland in the ninth century. And it should animate. And that's how you would see it in the Book of Kells. So see the, the undifferentiated center and then the cross and the four creatures of the Gospels, these energetic beings who move around the center, emanating from that undifferentiated center. This is how you would see it in the document from the ninth century. This is from Syria, again, in the fifth century. This is the ascension of Christ. You see how Christ is in the center of a mandala in, in the upper register. So he is ascending and that's God waiting for him in the far corner. <laughs> and the, you should imagine that this cherubim at the bottom with all the eyes on the wings and the, and the flame-colored wings and the angels are, are circulating around the figure of Christ who is ascending. So here, Christ is the sun, S-U-N. And the sun, if you will, rolls from east to west. Uh, and carries the spirit with it. So, again, I asked this great young person, Eric Street, to animate it. There they go. <laughs> Into the Father. This is Christ in majesty. 
So uh, what's interesting here, this is from Germany, uh, Germany, France, that border. Uh, this is also from the 800s, very early. They maintained this wisdom knowledge of the transforming community. So the animals associated with the Gospels are in the wisdom order. They go Matthew, Mark, John, and Luke. And they are turned towards Christ in majesty. This is the Christ of the book of Revelation who says, I am the beginning and the end. I am the alpha and the omega. And again, from another document of the same time, now there is no center that's discernible. There is an energy at the center of these four gospel writers. These are four people writing the gospels. And, but there's clearly a center. I mean, we can feel it. We can see it. But it's not manifested. And that is like much of our lives. There's an energetic center to our lives. We don't even seem to be referring to it. But each of them is facing away from that which is informing them and impelling them to write these Gospels. And for writing the Gospel, you could substitute doing your work, doing your work in your world. And that's, that's the final uh, picture, the hidden center point. OK, thank you. So um, we have the uh, Tibetan mandala, the traditional one that the Sakyong brought us, and then the Book of Kells with the four creatures of uh, the Gospels <clears throat> emanating from, as I say, from the undifferentiated center as a backdrop for uh, some conversation that we might have. And Father Mitchell. A oh, director's chair. Director's mm -hmm. chair. That's My great. Gosh. So now director's we get chair. It. We get it. With the Sat Young and a bishop here, yeah. and I'm the director. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wonderful. Good. Did we pass. <laughs> <laughs> So the, uh, my role here is to have, we have about another uh, 50 minutes or so left in our session. And so my role is to moderate uh, two things. And, and we'll spend about half the time uh, giving an opportunity for the Sat Young and for Bishop Mark to have a conversation with each other about what's just been presented. And then we'll spend about uh, 25 minutes or so opening it up to questions and answers, or uh, as Elizabeth said, questions and responses. Uh, from our speakers. Does that sound okay? Yes. okay. Great. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Okay. I think I speak on behalf of all of us. Thank <laughs> you very much. Let's, uh, so you presented the mandala at, from the Christian and Buddhist perspectives as a pathway to compassion. And I think we, should, we want to talk about that in more detail, or at least give you a chance to talk about that. But, but maybe let's speak about the pathway to compassion hmm. And just to give this the context, uh, or get back to the context in which your presentation is being made. So could you talk to each other? What's one thing you've learned about compassion from a tradition other than your own hmm. that you value the most? Wow. Was what you, like you come from the Shambhala mm -hmm. and the Buddhist tradition, the Christian tradition. And so in your interfaith work, in your dialogue, what's something that you value personally that you got from another tradition? Hmm. Well, I can say very immediately in my relationship to Tibetan Buddhism and to a person, uh, Nipam Rinpoche, that um, both the way he and the Tibetan Buddhist community carries themselves in a predominantly non-Tibetan Buddhist uh, world mm -hmm. in, in the United States uh, deeply impresses me, and especially given the backdrop of loss and suffering for the Tibetan people. Um, the generosity of spirit and the strength and the commitment that continues to be uh, undistorted. Mm -hmm. It would be very easy, it seems to me, for a community or an individual uh, to be blocked by mm -hmm. 
uh, that the suffering uh, from the mid 50s on. Mm -hmm. And I have not, not experienced that at all. Mm -hmm. I found this Im amazing generosity, which has good humor and deep intelligence and tremendous mm -hmm. commitment to compassion. Mm -hmm. So I, that's a witness to me. Um, right. So just the way they show up in the world. The way they show up in the world. It's a, yeah. Ninety percent of life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. showing up. Yeah, it is. Yeah, good. You could say that the other ten percent is what makes the difference between a B and an A, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. I'm, I'm gonna move over here so you don't have to turn your so you all can talk to each other. Is that okay? I'll yeah, just I'll just move the. I'm gonna block some people here. I, if, I, if I move over here, I'll, okay. That way you you can talk to each okay. other as well. I want to make sure you. You're my new example. <laughs> Compassion and action. <laughs> I mean, I'm. <clears throat> was um, posted here uh, by the Browns, and they have on the wall a uh, picture of the Declaration of Independence. And uh, I was sort of just reading it yesterday when I arrived, looking at it, and it was sort of the version that Jefferson wrote with things scribbled out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was sort of struck by how, you know, like uh, Bishop Anders is saying, that um, through the sort of enlightenment, all these thoughts of humanism came up, and that weren't particularly religious, but it, it apparently became very obvious that uh, this was compassion and act. The fact that I'm here and that we're having mm -hmm. this discussion in a country that is predominantly Christian, and I think that, and also even within a secular situation, that the notion of compassion is evident. And so it, it seems like for a lot of us, sometimes we, we sit and meditate and we're trying to be compassionate. And then we leave our meditation seat and get mad at somebody and who is more compassionate than we are. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think the examples are always coming up. It's like what we want to be and then what actually is happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that is, you know, we can say we are these things, whether Buddhist or Christian, right. I, I tried to use it Buddhist, but um, <laughs> in, in terms of that kind of situation that, you know, um, we can be these things, but then the manifestness of compassion is, is a very strong, powerful thing. And I think when we feel it, mm -hmm. we remember it. And it affects us, you know, subliminally, I think. And, and so I think it's, you know, um, again, right. it's, it's, it's coming, I think to a certain degree, it's coming to a language mm -hmm. and how, how comfortable we are with the language. And because we all know when we feel it or, or, or receive it. Mm -hmm. And we all know that when there's a moment where we decide to open up and look mm -hmm. beyond. And um, it seems like over the years, we've used different ways of, of trying to express that. So it seems to be... Um, if it wasn't, if it wasn't a respected thing universally, then the tendency to generate yourself would be much less. And I think to some degree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I really love that. There's um, putting the context of our our friendship and and the overall kind of interaction mm -hmm. in the frame of being in this country is is interesting because it's a container, right? Mm -hmm. um, exactly which has allowed for a lot of social experimentation. Mm -hmm. And I'm really grateful for that. Uh, my own church, the Episcopal Church, um, you know, came here in a very different mode than it is now. <laughs> you know, it was, it was easier for people like me <laughs> um, 250 years ago. Um, they had a lot of power mm -hmm. of a certain sort. Uh -huh. And that was taken away um, and, and given up. And that was a really good thing. So we transformed within the American context. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure that's that that's true for Tibetan Buddhism mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think it's, it's, there's a certain kind of, with Tibet, it's very interesting because Buddhism was in India traditionally, and it went to Tibet and roughly 1,500 years ago. And it's pretty amazing that it remained roughly from the 8th century to 1959, roughly, yeah. during that period, that it remained in more or less isolation. And these deep spiritual powers, so in wow. some ways it was like a global experiment 
on, on human nature, because the country, as people know it, we call it sort of the um, land of the snows, and there are basically the Himalayas in the south, Kulmung Mountains in the north, this vast desert, desert. So it was geographically isolated, and very few people ever came and went, literally, and it was impenetrable. And so you have, for centuries, these practices. And I think one thing is important, and you, I think you pointed this out, that Tibet, before Buddhism, was a warrior culture. Mm -hmm. It was an aggressive culture. And mm -hmm. it was a dominant force in Central Asia. And so then, with the advent of uh, Buddhism, it took up the notion of compassion. Mm. And uh, it transformed the culture. And Tibetans are still very much uh, very strong and tough people. But um, it wasn't exactly <coughs> like you know, preaching to the choir, as you're saying. Right. So it was very intense in that way. So it was held in, in, in that kind of container for all these centuries. And now, you know, it's kind of entered into the world. So it's, a, I mean, it's a human experience is very interesting because it's very um, unusual to get a situation that is actually isolated, but also very sophisticated mm. intellectually um, than to interface mm. here. Well, I mean, perhaps even that isolation was a, like a crucible that increased the sophistication to some degree. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's hard to know that. And Elizabeth, yesterday in her wonderful um, introduction to practices, talked about um, the pre-Buddhist uh, shamanism in, uh, in Tibet. That had a... a a leavening and a really interesting effect on what came to be classical Tibetan Buddhism, didn't it? Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, it's the same way I think Christianity adapted as it went to right. Europe and yep. to the Celtic tradition and many traditions like we saw here, yep. adopting and mm -hmm. incorporating holidays and various things. I think uh, Buddhism transforms. It's very different, you know, the teachings are essentially the same, but if you go to Thailand or Japan in terms of how it happens. And I think definitely there is a strong relationship to the uh, indigenous culture of appreciating, you know, sort of like the First Nations people, uh, appreciating the elements. Right. And I think that was very much uh, incorporated. And, and it was fairly easy for Buddhism because Buddhism has an inherent respect for sort of the um, physical world and appreciating the physical world. And those are seen as sacred. So I think that was able to adapt in that way. So there was definitely this quality where um, you know, it was a bit of a marriaging of traditions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, in the case of uh, the Church of England, which was the source of the Episcopal Church, I've felt for several years now that uh, the island nature mm -hmm. of the United Kingdom really had an effect, as you would expect if you think about it, on the spirituality of the Church of England. And once it comes into this big continent, mm -hmm. it, change, it changes and becomes, I think, in some ways, yeah, um, more yeah. transparent mm -hmm. and um, maybe a little more self-confident. Um, well, I don't know if that's possible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but different, uh, but different, yeah. Well, you were about to say. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm gonna play the everyman here and, and, and just ask, uh, so you mentioned compassion and certainly compassion is a very strong and powerful virtue in Christianity, obviously, with the compassion of Christ and the cross, and also one of the four immeasurables in Buddhism. Uh, so compassion, the word in English, comes from two Latin words, compassio, means to be with someone in their suffering. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound like a very pleasant thing to do. What, you know, who wants to feel pain? Who wants to suffer? So can you give us some suggestions some uh, advice on how we can overcome this hesitancy we have to feel pain and to want to be with another person in their pain. Mm -hmm. Some practice, some just some advice for us. We are, we, so we're sitting here at your feet. We want to learn from you. Uh, you're, we want to gain your we're wisdom. We're sitting at your feet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna, we'll come to that later. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think there's, I mean, to a certain degree, I guess, to use your language, to actually have compassion and, like you said, to take on other suffering and be genuinely concerned. Um, we literally say in the, in the Buddhist teaching that you could try to explain it, but ultimately it's a miracle. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we have.
have this term, a ma ho, and it means how marvelous. Mm -hmm. So there's a point where, this is sort of the notion of speech and non-speech, is that it's kind of inexplicable in terms of how a human being, and these, in the Buddhist tradition, compassion is essentially connected with the word bodhisattva. Mm -hmm. And the bodhisattva is a person who's dedicated their life to the relieving of the suffering of others. So that is their primary. And I think the analogy, when I was looking at um, the early uh, murals of Christ as a, sh a shepherd, mm. one of the examples that we use in um, Mahayana Buddhism uh, is the notion of a shepherd, that a person who takes the path of compassion is like a shepherd, in that they think about others first as though the person who's tending a sheep, they make sure the sheep are first. And so that is the inherent act of the mind. Mm -hmm. And we say that, that miraculously somehow that intention is uh, born or comes out. Now you could explain it in terms of karma and many other aspects. And I think, you know, then at the same time there is a practice um, which we call lojong or mind training. Mm -hmm. And this is where we work with, without, we may not feel the pain or how to work with it, but we work with the mind and training the mind so that it becomes comfortable and used to and handling almost and having mm. the strength to handle the suffering of others. Mm -hmm. So that is the notion of um, mind training where we practice um, taking on the ills and suffering and pain of others mm -hmm. when they're in suffering. We actually breathe it in and we have a meditation where you're taking on the suffering. You exchange life back. Mm -hmm. And so that is a you know, meditative way of dealing with that suffering. And you know, I think what's important here is, is that sometimes it is overwhelming. And, and I think that, but how do you sustain it, which is another one of the immeasurables, is you have to sustain it. Mm -hmm. So compassion, we all have moments of compassion, but how does it become a continuum in our in Right, that's, our yeah, it seems like that's the key. We, can, we have con compassion for people we obviously feel close to. Right. But having compassion for a world. Exactly. Well, that's why it's called the immeasurables, because this notion of how, you, how can you take an uh, affection and love we have for a person who is very close to us, and we have it immediately, and then how do you extend that mm -hmm. out? And I think one of the things that we say is that the mind is actually capable of immeasurable love and compassion. Mm -hmm. That it is able, because it is like space itself. It's, can go, it has no boundaries. And the boundaries we create are sort of self-imposed. Mm -hmm. So I think those are things, you know, you meditate and think about it and work with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then I've got a, yeah, if Bishop Mark, if you, Bishop Mark, you would re respond okay. to that too. And then I've got a follow-up question on okay. that too. Um, well, you're a passionist priest, mm -hmm. right? So I think, I mean, the Romans always do more Latin than we do. Um, <laughs> but I think that passion really is translated as a, as a bigger word than mm -hmm. only suffering. Mm -hmm. It's actually about uh, our passions. So it's really, uh, could I say, it's living life with the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, um, that's how we, how we do it is by falling in love. Mm -hmm. I think it's about that. Um, and, and to fall mm -hmm. in love, you have to get beyond abstraction. Mm -hmm. uh, abstraction is one of our big problems uh, yeah. in the world right now. Uh, and spiritually, the West has been a very abstracted place for a long time. We're waking up right. from that. But and by, um, just by yeah. abstractions, what do you mean? Just by abstraction, I mean. Um, Beam me I think up. I know what you mean. Beam me like, up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like this is a, a difficult, painful place, and mm -hmm. I'm going to... Or we to live in a world of concepts? Is that concepts, what you mean by abstract? Uh, so we, we live in a or, conceptual or world? Or place ourselves in a world where we're removed from the passions of this world. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, heavenly places. Mm -hmm. But we can do it intellectually. We can do it by numbing ourselves. We can do it with alcohol and drugs. We can, right, you right. know, there's a lot of ways we can. A lot of ways, because nobody wants. Not we too many people want ourselves. to suffer. We, there, right. we have many means of escaping from consumerism to alcohol. But as Elizabeth said yesterday, sometimes it's beauty that's overwhelming, mm -hmm. because it puts a demand on us. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems to me that the model of of Christ's life, you know, when we look at the life of this person, was that he was extending himself into life. Mm -hmm. He was living life with people. Mm -hmm. So he, he took as many barriers out of his life as he possibly could, right. it seems to me. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that would be a way to compassion right. in a very sort of practical way uh, mm -hmm. for me to stop putting the barriers between myself and other life. 
And I mean by other life, not just, um, not just human life. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, uh, yeah. Because yeah, we're, we're talking about having compassion for the world. We're not just talking about forming a good human society. Yeah. We're trying to talk well, about forming um, a good I, earth community. Yeah, I led a retreat uh, a long time ago, 10 years ago, with Rupert Sheldrake. And um, we were in Canuga in western North Carolina. And there was um, an elderly priest, uh, Episcopal priest, with us. And we had done some beautiful work with uh, equine therapy with horses. Mm -hmm. And he was crying. And uh, that evening, I asked him, what was it that, you know, why was he crying? And he said that when he was a young person, he had been raised on a farm in North Georgia. And it was a 500-acre farm, pretty, pretty good-sized farm. And he, in his mind, he counted 27 species of other being with whom he had a close relationship. Mm. Horses and donkeys mm -hmm. and chickens, et cetera. And now, in his older age, he was in his 70s, uh, he and his wife had um, a beautiful, wonderful dog who did uh, pet therapy. They took this little dog into the hospital. And everything was cranked down to this one relationship with one other species. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where we are. We are yeah. um, there's a, an enormous world which is being snuffed out species by species, moment by moment. And most of, most of us are not related to much of that life. Right. So, so you sp in both of you spoke about the need to overcome our sense of separation and feel connection. Mm -hmm. So, um, boy, I've, I've got several questions. I, uh, one of the people who's been very influential in my life is Thomas Berry, and I know he's also been influential in your life. And so he speaks about the problem with humanity is we, we're autistic as a species. Mm -hmm. And by that he means we, we're, we can be very bright, we're very talented like, a, like an autistic child can be, but we've lost the ability mm -hmm. to connect with species other than our own. Right. And we can almost say maybe that's a, another way of, of speaking about uh, the individual self. We, each individual, in a way, we each become autistic because we have a little world into ourself. Right. And you talked about the abstraction or mm -hmm. concepts. So what are some ways, again, some practical ways to overcome this autism that we all suffer as a species, being, meaning vis-a-vis -vis our relationship to other species as humans, but also intra-human? One thing, as I was listening, is that, that compassion and all these elements, I think, that we've been talking about, we're talking a little bit like that they're not uh, practical in some ways. That, mm -hmm. you know, how, how, why would it be helpful to experience other suffering? But my feeling is, is that a lot of these traditions have survived because they are practical and that they um, have survived because they've helped human suffering and human beings. Mm -hmm. So, and it's becoming evident now, obviously through, especially there's been a lot of research on meditation, and especially on mindfulness meditation. Mm -hmm. And, one of the basic elements um, of the happiness factor altogether is, is that when a human being does not have a relationship with other people, that they are not fulfilled themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That there is an innate human need to connect. And, it's, and therefore, when you do compassion, it's not just good for the other person, it's also good for you. Mm -hmm. There's an immediate kind of, uh, and I think when we help somebody and when we have that moment, it adds meaning to our life. It adds purpose to our life. It, it, it makes us do things beyond ourselves. And I think compassion at that level is just that ability to connect. And, I, and if, you know, part of this is that we live, as you're saying, in a very kind of um, sort of individualistic world where the world is centered around this mandala and we need to know how that we are interconnected mm -hmm. and that the pathways of the interconnection is, is the realizing that in order for myself to be happy and experience and to live, that there does need to be a way to communicate with other people. Mm. And, you know, compassion is definitely that element. And I think any society that has compassion is a stronger, is a stronger society, mm -hmm. any relationship that has it. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden, you can begin to see when things are not working out or how right. to deal with it. So I, mean, I think there was a practicalness to the whole thing. Right, yeah, so, it's twi so Shakespeare was right. It's twice blessed. Mm -hmm. Twice blessed. blessed. Blessed is the giver and the receiver. Yeah, I, I would add to that something really practical, and that is um, just as you have to make a commitment to sitting mm -hmm. uh, or to saying the offices, um, this is a simple idea. 
I would make the, I try to make myself the same commitment to getting up and going outside. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's so easy to be, for me to be absorbed in my technology and mm -hmm. my work at my desk and to simply uh, get up and leave is a spiritual commitment. For you to go outside, I mean, to go connect outside. with the natural world. I was the rector of a little church in Middleburg, Virginia, mm -hmm. and every day I walked from my office to the library, which was altogether one mile. Mm -hmm. And so this is not nature, if you will, mm -hmm. but I would encounter lots and lots of human life mm -hmm. on the way. Um, I too am like, like the second staying with the Browns, who are the most generous mm -hmm. hosts, and I went out on their a little deck this morning, mm -hmm. and um, because I put myself outside, I was able to see a great blue heron fly over, yeah. and three geese, and innumerable other kinds of life mm -hmm. I could hear around me. It, just the spiritual practice of moving mm -hmm. and committing to that put me in a place where I could experience life other than my life. Right, and because and because it's a of our idea. because of our our modern world is so cut us off from the natural world, right. the modern human world. Maybe we need new spiritual practices uh, or to recover some that will help us connect. And, yeah. and one of your suggestions is just getting outside. It's a spiritual practice. Yeah. Take well, a walk. Take a walk. Take a walk. There you go. Hey, it sounds, that can be said in many different ways. Right. Yeah. I mean that in the best way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I knew because you're a bishop, you would. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let me, I have one, I have a chance for one more question. So let me, um, so the mandala that you've talked about, and you've talked about the, the center and then the circumference and moving in and moving out. And moving out, of course, is that sense of compassion or connection with yeah. the larger world, but moving in. So you both spoke about the innate goodness in the human heart, uh, the innate goodness in the human person. Well, let me again ask an everyman question here. And many people go inside and they don't like what they see. Hmm. Today, we have a lot of self-hatred and a lot of people go inside and they're not happy with themselves. And so what would you say to a person who has that sense of self and, and yet you sit up here on stage and tell me there's an innate goodness in me and I'm blessed and yet I go inside and feel such a different experience? What, would, what kind of advice would you give to someone who had that observation? Me? <laughs> if you like. <laughs> I'll give it a crack too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I think this is a journey that I've gone through because I have sat up here a lot and talked about the notion of goodness. And mm -hmm. for myself, and I, I've heard it from my father and the teachers that mm -hmm. I've received. And, you know, I think I have, I have um, you know, two sort of ways of looking at it. One is, is that kind of a we all have to kind of go through a journey, I think. And so everyone can tell us everything. So I, uh, the path of it for myself, even being born in this tradition, is something that I have to go through and I have to examine it. And so I think that is something that, you know, I think all of us go through periods where we're doubting ourselves. And I think that doubt is part mm -hmm. of the process. It's, it's natural. Mm -hmm. And the other, which, you know, I, I've talked a lot about with <clears throat> Bishop Anders is that I also feel like as a community, we need to create a, a, a cultural situation where we allow um, or, or we proclaim that humanity is good, that we try to create an environment where mm -hmm. um, people feel like they can rely. Because I agree, a lot of times when people meditate or they are quiet, what they do is they fall into sort of self-analysis mm -hmm. and um, self-hate and uh, guilt. And there are many issues that arise. And so part of what we're talking about here is, is that um, the mandala is saying that the somehow fundamentally that there is, a notion, that there is this notion of um, completeness. Another way I like to think about is worthiness, the notion of human worthiness and completeness. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to be both environmental. We have to be supported. And if we are not supported either by family and friends and community, it is very hard to sit as an individual mm -hmm. Out within a context of aggression and try to come. You have to be a very strong person to do that. So, you know, a lot of what we're doing is we're providing environments where people feel protected physically and emotionally mm -hmm. so that they can go there. Because you're right, if, if you can't go there, then you're always guarding. And, you know, also, you know, it's, it's endemic because in terms of 
when you're watching television, is telling you basically what you don't have, and you need to get mm -hmm. this. Sure. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of endless in terms. You you turn on the TV, and it's a list of things you need to get. So you realize, well, maybe I do need it, and then you thinking you're not enough. And this is different than I think ego boosting. Mm -hmm. And there, there's there's some kind of deeper element going on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and once you get that, you're going to have to get it again because right. you know. It, is that what you discovered? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It, like you said, it, I mean, we can meditate and have a sense of, of, uh, of inner peace or calm, but it has a shelf life of about 30 minutes because we go into a world where we're constantly bombarded with we're missing this, we're missing exactly that. Right. Yeah. This is what we're talking well, about. Gregory of Nyssa, yeah. um, who was writing you know, about the time of some of these images that I showed, said that the, the emptiness in terms of desire in our hearts was like the... Hebrew people as slaves in Egypt, and they had to make these bricks. Mm -hmm. And the mold for the bricks, every time you take a brick out, it's ready for, to be filled again. Mm -hmm. And that's what our appetites are like and mm -hmm. our consumerism. But uh, the journey into the heart, so the heart is a treasury. Mm -hmm. And some of the things, like the mother of Jesus put things into her heart deliberately. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we do. You know, we think about something we value, and we love, and you, if you will, you put it into your heart, you treasure it. But there's a lot of other things that make their mm -hmm. way into the, your center without our consciously choosing. Mm -hmm. And so that's the scary part, is that's all in there. And we know it. At one level, consciously, we know there's a lot of material in our center that is quite frightening to us. Oh, yeah. So it does take a lot of courage to go there. Mm -hmm. And we, we also know that that's our actual center. You know, it's not in the mind, it's not in the head. So we've right. got to take a journey to be full people into the heart, but it's, it's very frightening. Now, one of the things in the United States is that almost everything that we need can be found in Star Wars. And um, Tell us more. <laughs> well, it's a big story. It is. Right? Yeah. And, it gets, uh, <laughs> and it's a continuing story. It's a <laughs> continuing story, it's a big story. And uh, when Luke goes into the cave, and has the fight, you know, right? Do you and know what Star Wars is? <laughs> no, I know what Star Wars is. It all started with Nick at night. You know, so there is no past, right? Everything is present to us all the time. Uh, all the shows of my childhood are still out there, bad as they were. Um, <laughs> so what he finds out is that he was fighting his, himself, mm -hmm. right? Um, when he defeats this warrior and the helmet rolls off, you know, it's heat. Mm -hmm. So that's, we know that's the case. It so we've all got an inner, the inner battle. The, the inner battle, you know, and we've got to go well, in, it, it, into the cave the, of the, the heart. The demons within that we have to face. We have to go into the cave of the heart and mm -hmm. have that battle. Mm -hmm. So how do we get the courage to do that? And so the Sakyong said it, you know, we have to have a web of love. We need, yeah. But there are some people who do not have a web of human love. Right. And we yeah. need to face that. There, mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who have, right. do not have the network that I was blessed with or that maybe mm -hmm. I trust you were blessed with and, and you. So what about that? And that seems difficult to me. Um, mm -hmm. Jung, again, Carl Jung and Eric Erickson separately looked mm -hmm. at the childhood of Jesus and they said, this is interesting. This was a boy who was born in a little tiny village, maybe like as remote as East, East mm -hmm. Tibet, where your father was born, uh, that is, um, you know, maybe 200 people, something like that. And this is a boy who had no father. Mm -hmm. Now, his mother made these claims about the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But how do, well do you think that would go over in your community, right? <laughs> yes, I'm pregnant, um, but it was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> So he was known in this tight little community as a bastard in a very traditional community mm -hmm. which would not have treated him well for that. Mm -hmm. And so what they said was he had a breakthrough. He did not, he had a loving mother, he had a loving father, but there was a lot of perhaps negative material coming at him from mm -hmm. his, his peers and from the parents mm -hmm. of his friends and mm -hmm. so on. And so he would say, I don't have a father, I don't have a father, I don't have a father, until finally he has this breakthrough, you could say, to the universe, mm -hmm. and says, oh, I have a father, mm -hmm. a heavenly father. Yeah. And that is a journey in itself. 
right? Mm -hmm. To right. connect to that which is the compassion of, of, of the cosmos, that it is there. I mean, I would say God. Uh, Thomas mm -hmm. Berry, I think, would come, ha, came to a point in his life where he would say the mm -hmm. universe. Um, so, you're giving, yeah, so you're sharing a lot, because you're saying what well, we need to be people of compassion to overcome this autism or this sense of separation or this low self-image is a community of support. Right. So maybe as we... And that as, community of support could be vast. But personal. Vast, Always personal. Uh, person. So maybe, because we're it's, Louisville's trying to become a city of compassion. We've, we've signed on to the charter, and many of our organizations are trying to, are also signing on. So maybe a piece of advice you're giving us is to make sure we form networks of support. And then also caring especially, as you pointed out, for those who don't have right. personal relationships that are supportive. But then what you're pointing out also is that we have traditions, religious traditions, and, and people who are heroic mm -hmm. that can inspire us. That's and true. Because they suffer. They're available to us. They're, they're available. Even though we may not have people immediately available, we do have traditions. And so maybe these could help support our community of Louisville. I didn't say that, but that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> that's why I'm sitting in the director's right, chair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It just came up. It all yeah. goes up here. I well, with that, let's turn it out here. Okay, okay great. That? So we have, about a, we have about 20 more minutes, and we want to make sure that everybody here gets a chance, or anybody here that has a question uh, gets a chance to raise it for us. So we have people with microphones oh, that are look. going around. And uh, we want to make sure we take, uh, we'll take one from down here, and then we'll go up here to the balcony, uh, <laughs> to, to those in the like expensive like seats up there. And uh, yeah, if you would, here's, here's a question uh, I would ask you all to consider maybe. Take a personal situation that you know of in your world uh, where there's trauma, where there's a lack of compassion, and maybe you can ask them to speak to that situation uh, that needs to be, that needs compassion spoken, brought to it, okay? What, what is it in your world, your life, that needs compassion? And maybe ask for some advice or some guidance on how we can bring that forward. That's just a suggestion. Okay. Please. I, I'm going to let them think about that because as an educator, I'm in pain right now. I see such bullying and children feeling unsafe at school, unprotected, not centered. Now, I heard some really good things. I heard that we need to be complete and see life as good. I heard right at the end, networks of support and heroic witness, teachers. Uh, every child deserves to feel safe at school. I don't see that. I look at, yes, we have them in school. I know that at home, that's a key. Uh, I think their parents often don't feel good centered, safe, mm -hmm. uh, they need witness. I, I, I'm just at loss and almost in tears. You're, you're overwhelmed with the current situation. I, I believe one person can make a change, can make a difference in this world. Mm -hmm. I think a teacher makes a great difference mm -hmm. right. in this world. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, let me let me take your, I think, so there's a great round of a, a sense of approval of what you said. Let me make, make, make your statement into a question. So what, how can you address a person who feels overwhelmed by the suffering or, let's say, a situation, she mentioned bullying in the school. So what's a way that a person feeling overwhelmed with a situation that lacks compassion, what advice or what suggestions could you give? Well, I'm going to the start by saying that the, te the teachers are the heroes in this story, in many cases, and the children themselves are the heroes. Um, but, but the rest of us are the villains. And I think that is part of what I want to say to you. And my, my daughter just left teaching in, in one of the most difficult schools you can imagine because there was a gun incident. And she got her children to safety. This is in the South Bronx. And the police said, you're no longer safe because she was identified as the person who, the, the man who had the gun saw her. So she's not teaching there anymore. Um, in long conversations with her, trying to support her through this really difficult time, she loved her students and they really loved her, eighth graders. Um, 
I said, I came to the point where I said, Pilar, we as a culture are putting this, we're asking you as a teacher to, to solve this for us. Um, now, when I was in that little village where I took a walk every day, I had a Bible study, and the Columbine killings took place while, we were, while I was there in this community. And um, we were in this Bible study, and an elderly woman said, in, uh, we were talking about that, about Columbine, and she said, I am responsible for those killings. And we were all just shocked. I, I didn't even know how to respond to her. But after a moment, I said, well, why do you say that? And she said, because my children are grown, my husband has died, I'm worried about my money, and I have been voting against taxes for schools for years now, because it doesn't affect me. I don't have children in the school, et cetera. And thus, I have voted to warehouse the children in our community. So the school, the high school there was about 2,000. Kids, it was too big. There's bigger schools than that. So what I'm saying is that we are making societal choices that put it on you as a teacher. And one answer is we can make better choices and really live as a human community that values our children and values our teachers. I think you want to applaud that. <laughs> Very good. Did you want to respond also? Um, well, before this, I was in um, doing a program and conference in uh, Chicago. And we were dealing with the uh, youth violence, especially in the south and west side of Chicago. And we were dealing with many teachers who were experiencing uh, severe um, obviously violence and shooting. And so, you know, there's, it's obviously a very kind of complicated situation, but the children and the teachers and, in those cases, neighbor neighborhoods and um, all together are taking, on, are taking on the stress of the entire culture. Mm -hmm. So we have a very pressurized kind of uh, society and, um, you know, and it's, it's being taken on by the children and it's been taken on by the teachers. <coughs> They themselves originally would have been teaching children within the support of the family and the society. So you would have been doing one thing, in a sense. And now you're having to deal with um, family issues and social issues. And there's also issues of personal issues of, of children not knowing themselves. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's a <coughs> societal kind of you know, pressure or breakdown, however you want to think about it. So ultimately, it's going to have to um, be kind of a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of it is how, how you can begin to work with uh, the parents so that they ed educate their children. Um, I know just practically that we have been introducing short periods of mindful meditation for some of the children so that they have, at least at the beginning of class, um, a few moments where they don't feel completely stressed out. <coughs> And uh, I talked to one you know, young uh, African-American boy and said, you know, he's all morning he's stressed out and walking to school stressed out, coming back stressed out. And there's no time um, for him just to mm -hmm. be him. Mm -hmm. And so he appreciated <coughs> the meditation because that allowed him to right. at least have a moment. Mm -hmm. It didn't, wasn't going to solve everything, but at least it was a moment. So I think there's issues where we can take some of these, you know, I think things we can offer such as contemplation and meditation. Mm -hmm. right. And then also, I think, as a spiritual, as a spiritual community, um, how can you actually take some things within our tradition and offer it in a, in a secular, secular setting, a family setting? Right. Yeah. And, but it's definitely a um, you know, holistic situation. And then it's realizing that education and you know, educating the children and so forth is an essential part of a strong society. Mm -hmm. And then obviously that brings in finance and brings in the cost. So how we can support that. Yeah. And you bring up a good point that there's a growing interest of in bringing mindfulness practices mm -hmm. to education now. It is, and I think it's something that is, you know, sort of everywhere. And I, I think part of that is that the things in society 
that we know um, are intense are now uh, being absorbed into the mind. Mm. And that, that is affecting people's ability to deal with their own emotions and feelings. Mm. So then obviously it creates, you know, can create more and more sort of fragile people so, with more challenges. So you bring it back again to the mind training is very important. Well, I think, I think some kind of working with the mind is important because that's how we deal with issues. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, social issues because that's how we learn things and that's how we, that's how we develop our principles. Mm -hmm. And so I think what's happening here in Louisville in terms of being a compassionate city is a good example for other places mm -hmm. to say that even just the idea of it inspired me. That, oh, that's, that's a great thing to do, that a city would actually do that. Right. And so that we can have this discussion and there's not our question. Mm -hmm. And I know the superintendent of schools was with us yesterday and right, yeah, that, that this is a not just a city commitment but the schools have made this commitment. Well that's been a wonderful thing since uh, our mayor brought it forward and many other organizations, the school, uh, uh, universities, uh, the school system, other organizations are beginning to uh, heed the call and begin, and, to, and begin to ask serious questions about implementing it. And to that really important question that you asked. Um, there are schools, uh, I'm sure you know this, uh, for instance, in Northern Virginia, in the Alexandria, Arlington area, where they teach the students uh, how to make peace. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, and they actually make a compact with each other. So that if a conflict starts, uh, they put the principles of peacemaking at several places around the school, in the, in the play area, and in the classrooms, and in the halls, and they actually agree with each other, if a conflict breaks out, that they will move to one of those centers, which is a peace center, and mm -hmm. work their way through the principles of conflict resolution. <coughs> well, that's a very practical. It is. But it, so you're, again, what you're suggesting is there's both social yeah, practices it's as well exactly as the personal it's practices. It's a social yeah. practice. Well, let's go up, uh, up to the balcony. Anybody have a question up there? Oh. You, you have a, Christian, go ahead and give it to I can't see up there very clearly, but go ahead. Um, yeah, what, do you have a question directed to any one of the speakers in particular? Um, the the, the Rinpoche? gentleman from the... Rinpoche? It's probably me. Is that young? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get that a lot. Okay. This is for you. What's the name? Um, the gentleman in the yellow. Um, I have a question about meditation. Um, like, what should be our purpose when we meditate? What should we... Like, like, what should our goal be when we meditate during meditation? What should our goal be when we meditate? And you have a... <laughs> right. In 25 words or less. Right. <laughs> I think the main thing is to allow yourself to be in a uh, quiet place for a moment. And let, just for the moment you're meditating, don't worry about what you have to do that day, so the future. Don't make plans and try to be present. And one of the most effective techniques is just allowing yourself to feel your breathing mm -hmm. and just see, check in with yourself, see how you feel. And as you sit there, just the, you know, you'll have thoughts and different things will come up, but just paying attention to your breathing and, and just sort of allowing yourself to be there is very healthy, it's very strong. And so even though nothing is happening, Again, just realize something deep is happening. So the breath is very good, just being present. And the main thing is not being hard on yourself. So don't feel like you know, I'm not doing it right or these kinds of things. Um, that's always going to happen. Mm -hmm. Good. Good question. Okay. It's a very important question. Anybody else? Here? Christian, can you find somebody? Go ahead. Um, this is for the gentleman in the yellow. Um, um, the sheet you're sitting on, is it just for decoration or is it for something more like, is it for a deeper meaning? Um, probably both. That uh, represents the tradition there I'm from. And um, the notion of... Oh. Usually yellow represents wisdom, and so you have red and different colors representing different things. So often when we're doing different practices, we use different cloths and so forth. Any questions for the guy in purple? 
You didn't, you didn't come with your vestments on today, did you? Yeah, yeah. Good, very good. But he had animation, I didn't yeah. have animation. Yeah. Well, you know, what's, what I find interesting is we live, I think we live at one of the most phenomenal times in human history because when I was in college, I remember uh, the teacher in anthropology class asked us how many people had ever met a Hindu. Nobody raised their hand. Nobody. And I'm not that old. <laughs> But what a remarkable world we live in where we have so many other traditions available to us Beautiful. and uh, here in Louisville and uh, it's just wonderful. And so th this Festival of Faith has been an annual celebration of, of the wonderful richness of all the traditions. So it is helpful to ask practical questions like that mm -hmm. so we get to know each other better. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, I want to say thank you to uh, especially the students for coming. Really, oh, yeah. Really great. Yeah. What's, yeah what's, what schools are you from? Where? Seneca. Seneca High School. Everybody from Seneca? Yeah. All righty. Good old Seneca. Is it, um, is it, are you ninth through 12th grade? Is everybody here? Okay. 2016, great. yeah. So good. Well, great. Well, uh, so I've been asked to, uh, we're supposed to end in about, can we go about another five minutes or 10 minutes or so? Are you okay? No, <laughs> but look, you're out of class. This gives you longer. Out of, you're going to miss math class. Or whatever it might be. So give us, a, give us an, just give us an extra. Just give us an extra. Maybe eight. We'll go. We'll compromise. Some people want to go longer. Some people. If you need to leave, but let's just take about another eight minutes or ten minutes. Or so just so we get a few more questions. Because I think a lot of people had questions. Right up, right up, right up. Okay. Stop it. Yeah. Go ahead. Please. Uh, oh, good. It's on. Okay. Um, is it all right to make a comment to share a reflection? Um, so I wanted to share something about the Islamic perspective on compassion. Um, well, why, don't you, why don't you stand up then so people at least down sure. here can see you. Okay, uh, more pressure. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to share something about the Islamic perspective on compassion. Um, there's a verse in the Quran that says, uh, have you not seen the one who denies the relationship with God, that denies the relationship with the sacred? Another way you can phrase that is that denies the nature of reality, which is that, you know, um, existence has a grip on our souls and life really demands um, an answer to the question of the oneness of existence and the interconnectedness of all things. So that me, me as a human being, I feel the pain of others and I feel the pain of the world and I feel the the pain of nature and of the planet and it's an un, it's an undeniable unmistakable experience that i have everywhere i go mm -hmm. and so life poses this question it really grips me and grips my existence and it demands an answer to this experience and either i um i i disintegrate i crumble under the pressure of that experience or i catch my breath I compose myself and I begin to integrate by making space for something that's just a natural part of life. And so this is one perspective on compassion, is not as a, a cause, not as a, um, something that we can do, but as a responsibility to something that actually is, which is, which is that, you know, how can how can a soul really be settled in a world, in an existence where even one thing is experiencing pain? Mm -hmm. And so, so, so then we can maybe understand how having compassion just for one person or one being um, is necessitated, if not actually the entire, the entire world. And then so I can understand you know, the, the virtue of the bodhisattva as someone that has committed to return time and time again until all suffering is eradicated. So that is a conscious empowered choice, but also as, you know, as, as a we have to. Because the soul can never really be at peace until everything is really um, tended. So from the Islamic perspective, it's, it's considered that um, everything has a right over us. 
that in the same way that the body has a right over us, that if you don't tend the body, it squawks. If you don't feed it and rest it and, and keep it healthy. But all of existence has a right over us. That I'm not giving charity to the poor person. That I actually owe the poor person because God gave me some gifts to be able to have certain things in life. And other people have not been given those gifts. And so as part of this, you know, my heart being duty bound, I must tend to those that have not been given those blessings that I've been given as an existential acknowledgement of, you know, the setup, you know, as a kind of response to, um, as a conscious choice to participate in the restoration of um, an apparent imbalance, but that is actually a part of the sacred balance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we begin, we, thank you. We need, we need to have the voices of the other traditions uh, spoken as well. We've been focusing primarily on Christianity and Buddhism here, but thank you so much. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the distinctions that's often made in, in the Christian tradition is, is the difference between compassion expressed as mercy and as justice. You know, mercy is taking care of those who are wounded and bleeding, but justice is taking care and trying to resolve the, the, uh, the problem that brought about the bleeding and uh, the, the destruction. And, and so you, I think you spoke about both of those. That was Thank so you. beautiful and eloquent. Would you mind saying what tradition of Islam your thinking comes from? Uh, well, I would say that's Islam 101. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, very good. Anybody, anybody else? We have, I think we have a chance for, yeah, please. I, I didn't okay. take the prerequisite. Okay, we have one here and then, um, okay. Oh. Go ahead, yeah, please, go ahead. Okay, I, I just wanted to ask a question about, um, and this is for the guy in the purple and the guy in the yellow, both. <laughs> um, what do you think the role of fear is in our ability or inability to feel or show compassion? I mean, fear is both the, the um, biggest force in the universe and the most evanescent at the same time. Um, you know, this, the Christian scripture says that perfect love casts out fear. Right. And what we believe is that fear actually has no thus substance, but until we realize that it has all substance, it, I mean, it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has everything to do with the blockage or the flow of compassion. Mm -hmm. um, but it's easily overcome yeah. well, by love. And so you sp what kind of fear are you talking about? Any particular, can you give it a concrete expression? Um, I could, I could give an example. I feel, yeah. uh, I feel like we live in a very fearful society. And um, I feel like our f a lot of our fears um, keep us from allowing our children to experience life outside and life walks in the you know walks in the woods right, and things right, like okay. that, um, and to be able to absorb these um, outside beauties that will help them to feel compassion, because we hear of this and that happening with this kid and that kid, and right. there's so much media too, and I know that has a lot to do with it, but. Um, yeah, I mean, just with children, I mean, that's, that's one example and how, you know, we kind of, as parents, tend to place this fear in them, fear of strangers, fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, good question. Michelle, would you like to address that? Well, I think... <clears throat> I mean, there's fear that's sensible mm -hmm. in terms of just sort of not doing something that's um, dangerous. And then there's, I think, a fear which is, becomes um, <clears throat> oppressive and where we begin to, you know, fear each other, fear ourselves, and society just becomes a 
fearful place. And I think a lot of that is obviously not, not trusting. And, you know, to me that comes back down to, it's going to be a natural part of life in terms of, you know, at a human level, we're going to go through, everybody's going to go through things which they're not sure and fear is going to come about. And how we deal with those fears is, is essentially the pathway of life in terms of how you respond to it. And so I don't think it's ever going to be something where we're completely devoid of fear because uh, we don't know what's going to happen next. And we, we have to bring in what we know um, in order to bring, because life is challenging and is difficulty. And, but that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. It can be something that we can have the strength to arise. I think a lot of what we're talking about is how do we nourish ourselves with intelligence and compassion and strength to not give up <clears throat> and not collapse within ourselves or be so f afraid that we're, you know, that we're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think this is a, a demonstration of fearlessness. We're talking about different spiritual traditions. We're all kind of coming here. I mean, mm. it's you know, awkward for all of us in terms of being here because we're not sure exactly what's going to happen. And so that's somewhat fearless. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think you showing up is fearless in terms of being curious. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of demonstration of that. And so right. it's not so much just, you know, um, holding, holding firm and just charging ahead. But I think part of the overall fear is that, you know, I feel like we've come to a point where we do we or do, do we not trust people at some level? And are we creating a society where we don't, where we just think people are bad everywhere? Mm -hmm. And then that creates a society where, you know, it, if you look for the future, that's not a good recipe for success. Because, you know, as, as a species, we've survived because we've worked together. And any of us on our own, we're not gonna survive. Yes. Spiritually yes, or, or, you know, family-wise. So there's, you know, I think a level where we're, where can we Realize, and I think part of the notion of fear is that once you understand something, the fear, dis fear dissolves. Right. So in, in, in mm -hmm. meditation and things like this, you may have a really strong fear, and the next day all the fear is gone. And it actually never was. You know, it, it mm -hmm. just kind of dissipates like a cloud. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a very elusive theme. Yeah. And even if we're mad at somebody and we're fearful, and all of a sudden we get to know them, we realize, you know, they disappeared. So it's, it's a very yeah. elusive theme. Well, you, you make it. I mean, you, Go ahead. Well, I was going to give a concrete example. I like the way you uh, talked about it practically in terms of fear for your children um, to take a walk or whatever. I, there was a French woman who worked as an anthropologist in, on an island in Indonesia. And this community, uh, this tribe, really took dreams seriously. So the first thing they asked in the morning was not how well did you sleep, or what are you doing today, but what did you dream? Mm -hmm. And this was also an area where there were actual tigers in the forest, the kind that can eat you. And so she gave the example of uh, a child who would say to her mother in the morning in the answer to the question, what did you dream last night? Uh, if the child dreamt of a, of a tiger, the parents would help them discern. So this is love casting out fear. They would say, now, you know, there is a tiger in the forest, and I want you to be aware of that tiger because it can hurt you and kill you. But the tiger in your dream is a tiger you could revisit tonight. You could ask that tiger to come back into your dream, and then you could have a different relationship with it. And you have choices in the dream, she said. You could kill the tiger. You could befriend the tiger. You could master the tiger, you know, et cetera. So that's, uh, to me, actually a parent being a loving interlocutor with a child to help them learn a way to be less afraid and to be appropriately afraid about something that could really hurt the child. Right, so there are some circumstances where fear is appropriate right. or, and others where we need to look at it in right. a different way. I think we have one more question. We promised one more uh, person had a question. We'll conclude with this then. Yes. Um, I think we just... Yeah, I think we just got time for one more. First, I want to just say I'm so happy to be here yeah. uh, for the Week of Compassion. I'm uh, here for the, um, for the Charter for Compassion. I'm a partner. And I founded uh, uh, the uh, Kindness and Compassion Center in New York State. And although I've been very in tune with, I think, the growing 
lack of compassion over the, uh, I'd say, the last 30 years. Uh, it was a moment um, that really, f I felt that it was time um, after an incident with a, my daughter in the hospital. She was in there for outpatient surgery. And I was shown to a room where all the uh, relatives waited uh, for their loved ones to get done, get through. And I brought, of course, everything that I needed, a lot of books and things for, you know, the hours I'd be sitting in there. And when I walked in, I didn't notice this woman right away until I sat down and kind of turned around and she was dressed in surgical garb and she had the, the cap on and whatnot. And I couldn't help but not notice her. She was the only one on the wall and she was sobbing as she was petting this stuffed bunny, just sobbing. And I looked around the room trying to get my um, instructions from the people were there, like, let, clue me in, what's going on? And everyone had their eyes down. They were in their nooks. Uh -huh. They were on their iPhones or books yeah. or magazines. And she was sobbing. And I just thought, what, what's going on? Why isn't anyone reaching out to this person? Mm -hmm. And I did shove my knees up to hers and grabbed her hands and said, tell me what's going on with the person in the back. And I learned through her broken English that her child was having a tonsillectomy. And she couldn't communicate with the doctors because of the broken English. And she was terribly worried because the child, despite the fact was three or four years old, had disabilities where they couldn't speak yet. And her husband couldn't come to the hospital. She had to take a taxi there. So there was a lot of things going on. But it disturbed me so much that no one no nobody, one nobody paid attention to it. Paid attention to it. And yeah. at first, you know, after I thought about it later, I was a little bit kind of angry. But then I thought, compassion has become uncomfortable. And I think we touched on that, that it's seen as a weakness. And so I opened the center. And one of the things that um, I've been looking at and into the research of and, and meeting so many young people um, that social media seems to, this two-dimensional, it's making us more disconnected. And I just would like your opinions on whether or not uh, each of you think that the social media in that two-dimensional kind of world is impacting compassion. So about somehow social media can connect us in some ways, but disconnect us in others. Absolutely. Okay, so let's just say... You each have 60 seconds to deal with it. <laughs> I just, just to note the time, so. Yeah. But please, please do it. It's a well, great, I, great question because it's very timely. I don't think social media is doing that as much as um, the, what's been going on since I was a child, which is the pre-recorded. Um, so that's just pure entertainment. There's no interaction. Social media, there's a lot of interaction going on. You may be choosing what your persona that you put forward is, but that's not necessarily that's not necessarily bad. But I think it's more that we go less and less to live performances, and more and more watch the perfected performance behind some kind of screen, to which we have no connection at all. I mean, I, I do think that's problematic. Um, the social media is neutral as far as that goes for me. I, I think. I mean, you can bully through social media, but you can bully in person. Um, so, so Rupeshe, please give us a reply. Well, I just visited Google, and uh, not online. Not online. The building. At the building the location. The campus, and, uh, I was given a tour, so I was really fascinated. And uh, and it was very there. It was very. There was a lot of interaction in terms of how the campus is laid out. And. Um, so there's a definite awareness because people sometimes people feel like it's a bad thing, and at the same time, it's you know there was a lot of people obviously very concerned about their influence on the world, and uh, so I was just curious in terms of how technology is affecting things, and <clears throat> you know it seems to me that as we become more uh, technologically advanced this kind of thing has to be um, encouraged.
and support it. That there does, I mean, in my opinion, there does need to be some kind of sort of keeping up with the heart and mind. That, um, and we can't just you know, tweak everything. And, um, you know, there's a certain amount, and my understanding is that when you're dealing with just at a biological level, just seeing another face, seeing the angles and the warmth, and there's a lot that's happening. Mm -hmm. And we are, you know, we're not machines. And so that, that, that does need to be there. And at the same time, what it also indicates is that people are also so desperate of contact, that people want to reach out. So the technology is also demonstrating the deep human need to connect. Mm -hmm. And so that's obviously because people are texting all the time. And uh, as I was mm -hmm. flying here, it's, it's, um, it's the front of the Time magazine this, this week of the millennium generation whether they're connected or not connected. And I think that some say, you know, it's, it makes you more selfish, and others say it also makes you more open-minded because now the world is a stage. Mm -hmm. And so the borders are very, very porous. Mm -hmm. And so there's more acceptance and understanding. At the same time, um, there's a tendency sometimes to hide. I mean, I think part of what's gonna have to happen is for us to um, essentially be the masters of the technology. So how, how does that happen, as opposed to it, it utilizing us? And a lot of times, if we're completely depleted, then obviously it's used us. But if it's nourished us or made us more broad-minded or interested, then obviously it's helped. So, you know, there's, but I mean, obviously it's gonna be a non going It's here, so we've got, yeah. to, so, yeah. so it's not, we're not gonna be able to get, we're not gonna get rid of it, but it's a wise way to use it. Yeah, I think one of the things that obviously is, is that before you had time to absorb it, now it's, it's yeah. changing so fast. Right? Mm, so many right. of us feel like we're barely keeping up. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, let me. Uh, I think we need to draw it to a close here. Do we expect? The, uh, so, uh, I, I, yeah. In just a few. So, uh, yes, let me. Are you going to thank you? Just. Uh, so we have been. Now, those of us down here, we are very grateful that you all are here. Thank you so much for coming. Here, here. It's just been wonderful having you here. Here, Thank here. You. The, um, we're we're going to gather again at 1 o'clock. Uh, those of us coming back for the afternoon with Martin Laird will do a presentation when we have uh, Martin Laird and Richard Rohr uh, speaking from the Catholic or the Christian perspective on uh, compassion. But uh, a reminder. Uh, as you leave, there's books. Carmichael's bookstore is selling books, and there are some so pre-signed copies of the Satyang's book that are in the lobby, if you're interested in that. So among other books as well. And so we're, you, you know, I, 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 I we can't, we have to, we have to end now, now unfortunately. Up, but I'm sorry. Yeah. But may I, Joe, on behalf of the festival, thank you for an incredible job uh, helping to direct and moderate this discussion. Thank you so much. And also a huge, huge thanks, of course, to Bishop Mark and, oh, and, yeah. and, and the Sakyong. Thank you both so much for being here. And before we stand up, if it's okay, we, we have, um, as you know, been ending our sessions with a moment of silence. So we, we're just, we're almost done. You all have been unbelievably good. So we're going to make this short and sweet. Let's just have, let's just have we're going to do one minute. Somebody ask about what meditation is. Let's just this is, let's minute. just do it right here, right now. And any questions that you may have that were unanswered, please see if you can find us after, after the talk. But um, again, thank you all so much for joining. And let's, um, let's have our moment of silence now. I'll ring the gong uh, in just about a minute.
Do you, need, do you need a microphone here? Here we go. We're dismiss you in bus order. Thank you. We're going to dismiss you.